These five people are worth over half a billion pounds and are ready to invest their own money into the best business ideas they hear. But can anyone convince them to part with their cash? I would never buy one. I'm completely not interested. You display to me what sounds like an astonishing lack of focus. If you carry on waiting for this to be a success, you'll starve. I don't think you're professional and I am not investing in you. Here in the Dragon's Den, cash-hungry entrepreneurs are about to arrive with business ideas they think could make millions. They'll pitch their ideas to five investors who could give them the money to get their businesses going. So who are our five investors? The Dragon's in the Den. Our first dragon is Doug Richard, a Californian entrepreneur who made millions buying and selling software companies. He now runs Library House, a high-tech investment company in Cambridge. Duncan Bannatyne is worth more than £130 million. This Glaswegian entrepreneur has set up and sold several businesses and currently owns Bannatyne's health clubs, casinos and bars. Theo Perfitas made his £150 million fortune by buying failing companies and transforming them into multi-million pound businesses. He currently owns the La Senza and Contessa lingerie chains and Ryman's and Partners, the high street stationers. Rachel Elnor built Red Letter Days, a pioneering £20 million business selling gift experiences. But she hit the headlines when the company collapsed, only for the brand to be bought out by two fellow dragons. She's now using her personal wealth to invest in new businesses. Peter Jones' extraordinary business fortune began at just 16 when he started his own tennis academy. Since then, he's built a £250 million empire with interests ranging from telecoms to publishing and leisure. Some people are born entrepreneur, others try to learn it, and many never make it at all. Which group is Manal Devani in? She needs £70,000, but remember she has to get at least that or she gets nothing at all. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Minal Devani, and we are looking for £70,000 of investment and someone who's going to be a fantastic coach and mentor for our business, Must Be Games. So allow me to ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with Bollywood? Everyone? <laughs> okay. Well, if I can tell you a little bit more about it. Bollywood is the largest movie industry in the world. It produces over 800 movies a year, which is more than twice the number of movies that are produced by Hollywood each year. Um, for those of you who have been to India, you would have seen that it's an absolute national obsession. It's, um, Bollywood is something that people are really passionate about. 1.4 million, um, sorry, 14 million people, 1.4% of the population watch a Bollywood movie at the cinema every single day. And then when you look at um, the whole, the market for Bollywood... Meenal's pitch is well underway, but so far she's failed to explain anything about the product for which she needs investment. It's also very significant. So there are 20 million people in the Indian diaspora. And for these people, Bollywood is something that provides a very strong connection for them back to the country that they come from. And it's a way of breaking... And the dragons are already starting to lose interest. ...between older generations and younger generations for immigrant families. Um, because, you know, if you sit around the dinner table with any Indian family, particularly in India and also to some degree abroad, the conversation will invariably drift to, do you know what Amitabh's first movie was? Do you remember that line from that song? So, what's the concept? Um, the first game that we've developed is a Bollywood board game. Um, so the, the board has questions on music, storyline, roles and gossip. Players move around the board by answering questions on different aspects of Bollywood, which is something that really appeals to the Indian psyche. So that is Bollywood must be. I'm very open to hearing your questions 
and I'd love to discuss it further with you. Meenal needs to persuade the Dragons to part with £70,000 to market her Bollywood board game. However, her long-winded pitch has left the Dragons completely unimpressed. Meenal, I'm Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Do you always talk so much? You were talking away there and actually every single person kind of switched off and it's, it's an interesting thing when you're doing a pitch to actually judge how people are reacting to you because you need to sometimes temper your pitch according to whether people are receiving it or just okay. switching well, off. Well thank you for the input. My perception was actually different. I thought people were engaged. Um, tell me about how, what's led you to create this concept? Um, my background, this concept actually came out of business school. I was at Stanford Business School in the US and one of the things that um, we do a lot of at business school, particularly at Stanford, is talk about entrepreneurial ideas. I'd spent some time in India and was really interested in tapping into the market there. I'm assuming that if you've been to Stanford and you've got an MBA, that you would know that you're standing in front of a group of investors asking for £70,000. You haven't told us anything about what we're investing in, what the likely returns are, what your financial projections are, how much profit you intend to make, and, make it, and paint a very clear picture of how we're going to get a return on our investment and what's in it for us. The reason I didn't provide it up front was that I wanted to paint you a picture of the things that you might not otherwise ask. Manal, yes. I just need some basic numbers. Turnover, profit, turnover, profit, turnover, profit, first, second, third year. Okay, so gross margin in year one is £180,000. Mm-hmm and £110,000 of that is profit. The second year, we're looking at one and a half times that in uh, gross profit. So we're basically looking at £240,000 of gross profit. One and a half time would be two seventy, would wouldn't it? Sorry, yes, you're right. Just checking. Yeah. Uh, and net profit before tax? And net profit before tax. Can you excuse me for a moment? I just need to, I'd actually just like to get my numbers. Of all the people, I would expect not to need numbers. I know, uh, I'm sorry, I've just lost my nerve a little bit. Despite an education at one of America's most prominent business schools, Minal's grasp of the figures and her pitching technique have already been called into question. Duncan Bannatyne needs convincing on other matters. Minal, another thing you didn't tell us very much about was the game. Could you bring it over and put it on this sure. table for me to look at? Um, so the way the game works is you start at the middle of the board. You roll the dice, move in any direction that you want to move in. There are four categories of questions right, in line. Right, the questions are about Bollywood films. That's right. So you go round and round winning some of these. Yes. And the object is to get as many of these as possible in any colour? The object is to get one of each colour and return to the centre. So the first person to do that is the person who wins. Three thoughts just jumped to my mind. The first one is that these look so similar to a game called Trivial Pursuit. So it's really, I think, something that's not unique to Trivial Pursuit. It's kind of generic across a lot of games, but it works very well. The second thought is it seems very, very cheaply made. Really? OK, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it seems like cheap cardboard. And well, just on the quality <coughs> issue, actually, yeah. this is uh, the manufacturer of this actually does Hasbro's manufacturing for a lot of their international products. So it is up to Hasbro's international standards. Still looks cheap to me, but, but, my, but my third concern is that it doesn't seem much of a game. Is that because you're not interested in Bollywood? I'm, I just don't see an interest in this game. I think I'd rather play a game of Snakes and Ladders, to be honest with you. Duncan Bannatyne is clearly unconvinced by Meenal's board game, and he's already reached a decision. There's many games like this on the market. I mean, it isn't the new Monopoly. It isn't even Snakes and Ladders. I just don't see any excitement about it. For those reasons, I just, I'm not interested in investing in it. So I'm out. OK, thank you. I'm afraid it doesn't appeal to me either on a number of levels. And I think, I think the market for board games is just heaving and I just can't see any real differentiation. And I think this is actually badly made. I think Can it's I address that? But let me finish. I think it's very niche and it just doesn't have investment appeal to me, I'm afraid. 
Neither Rachel Elnor nor Duncan Bannatyne have been persuaded that Minal's game will be a success, so they're out. She needs £70,000, but Peter Jones is about to stick the knife in. Well, now, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Peter. Um, your opening pitch was probably the most boring, uninspiring pitch that was all over the place with no real message or directional focus, no delivery, certainly not captivating in any shape of the imagination. And I've really struggled to try and get into this as a result. And let's be honest, anybody can create a board game. It's not difficult. And for somebody that's been to business school, I would have thought that you would have had at least a little bit more experience with saying, this is the opportunity, this is the market it's attacking, instead of the very woolly generics. I'm a bit shocked. So I'm going to declare myself immediately out from this investment. I won't be investing in you. And it's purely because I thought your pitch was far too long and totally uninspiring. With Peter Jones utterly unimpressed by Minal's pitch, her bid for investment is collapsing. She'll have to fight to get Theo Pafitis and Doug Richard on side. You've got a long way. You've got a product already in the, in the channel. Mm -hmm. How did you fund it all? I funded it uh, from my personal funds and also from some family money. Right. Who funded you through uh, business school? Um, the company that I currently work for, which is a consulting firm. Right, so you've done this full time. You have got a day job. I do have a day job. Right. Uh, I'm sure one of the things that you're wondering is, if I've got a full-time day job, how does this work and why am I not leaving my job to run the business? For the moment, I really don't want to kind of load my own overhead into the business. And I think in my last few months have really proven that it's entirely possible to have the operation running without me having to be full-time in it. Minal thinks she can run her business successfully and hold down a day job. But will the Dragons want a bigger commitment? Doug Richard is ready to have his say. Actually, I think that what amounts to trivial pursuit for Bollywood is a great concept. I really do. And you have taken this an extraordinarily long way after work activity. Um, and it is a shame. I, I would love, I would actually like to invest in you, Manal. But I never invest in somebody who isn't in the business. And so all I can do is wish you the best of luck. But unfortunately, I'm out. Theo Pafitis is the only dragon left. There's, there's two reasons I'm not going to be investing in you today. So I'll tell you the bad news first, right? And that is, I think you made an absolute bloody hash of your presentation. The second thing, you're a long way down the road. I'm sure you can manage at the moment to take it to the next stage without an investor. So I will wish you lots and lots of luck and okay. look forward to seeing it on the shelves. Thank you. Minal is leaving empty-handed. Her pitch lost the Dragon's confidence right from the start and despite some interest from Doug Richard, she wasn't able to turn her fortunes around. I think that's one boring board game. Trivial pursuit for Bollywood? I actually think that's a good idea. <laughs>
sure how keen he'd be on. That's perfect, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, go on. <laughs> the Dragons wanted to know if it was a dead-end business. It's been operating for six years. Yes. Has it been making a profit every year for the last six years? Not every year, no. In the six years, it's made an overall profit of 3,700. So it's not doing very well then, is it? It's making very modest returns. Their poor figures cost them dearly. It's not profitable enough to be an investment that I would go into. You've proved your business doesn't make any money. There's nothing in it. So I don't know why you're looking for an investment. Peter Jones put the final nail in the coffin. I can see that, you know, you've got, you're burying people. I, I personally think you should bury the business. Now, the Dragons can be attracted to high-risk investments if they promise a chance of a big return. Paul Cockle from London has a high-risk proposition. Can he persuade the Dragons to give him £160,000? Hello, my name is Paul Cockle and I run The Generating Company. We are a contemporary circus production company. We produce shows, corporate events, commercial entertainment. We were born five years ago in the Millennium Dome, where most of us were involved in the delivery of the central show. This was a huge circus spectacular. Five years ago, when we left the Dome, we had the the dome curse, as it were. Nobody would give us any money, um, and so I invested what money I had, and five years on, we've created three shows, Storm, Gangsters, and now Lactic Acid. We are looking for investment to compete with our foreign competitors, which are obviously the Cirque du Soleil's of this world, who the Cirque du Soleil have an estimated worth of 1.2 billion. We want to get out there and compete, and we want you to invest. Thank you. Paul's grand plan is to turn his circus company into a commercial success to rival that of the world's most lucrative contemporary circus, the Cirque du Soleil. He needs £160,000 to help him on his way. Hi, Paul. Hi. I'm Rachel. Um, I'm just interested in that figure that you just gave out about Cirque du Soleil. It's worth, they say, £1.2 billion. What? Well, you have to think on? about it. You've got uh, shows on every continent. They have, well, now three shows running in Vegas, three resident shows. Um, I know that they've just invested over 150 million in opening the MGM Palace in Vegas, and the turnover of that one show is well over a uh, million dollars a week. I'm just trying to get some perspective yeah, on we're your a bit business smaller. in relation <laughs> to. Cirque du Soleil. We're a lot smaller, obviously. We, we, you know, we employ five people, they employ 2,000 in Montreal. We've got some way to go to catch up. Paul certainly doesn't lack ambition, but with only five employees, replicating the success of the 2,000-strong Cirque du Soleil will be an enormous challenge. It'll be tough for him to convince the Dragons he can pull it off. What was the last show you bought? The last show we put on was uh, Lactic Acid in the Larban uh, in um, South East London. How long did that run? What were the tickets? It show? was only three nights. It Why? Was a, well, it was a showcasing preview show, and that's the show we're now going into full production with. So you're looking for an investment to produce a show, is that right? No. No? No, no. We're looking for investment in the core team, constantly pitching ideas, creative solutions for your product launch or commercial entertainment or the actual devising of our own show. We've launched the Audi A8 in eight cities in Germany. We've launched a range of Speedo swimwear with the acrobats all sort of swimming over the audience. And we're launching a hotel for Butlins where we have all the acrobats sort of hanging off a truss on a crane over a big sort of urban ship with dancers and singers and, uh, and what have you. We are an arts-based business. Paul, can you just tell us um, about lactic acid? Yeah. What's it about? It, it's a show about the body. Uh, it's um, a fusion of dance and circus and new electronic music to actually describe it, it, 
what happens to the body when it overexerts itself and produces lactic acid. The concept for Paul's latest show has clearly not captured the dragon's imagination. With huge competition and creative output of such uncertain appeal, Doug Richard has serious concerns about the business model. Do you understand how Cirque du Soleil became what it is today? Yeah. Good. In two or three sentences, explain to me how they did it. Okay. First of all, they were of the moment. Several events came along, such as opening the Toronto Olympics or whatever, that were the great contracts to get. They also uh, uh, creatively secured the backing of uh, Canadian government and public money, and after that, the rest was talent. Okay. Wrong. They took that show and they changed nothing. They went out over and over and over again and made new money around and around the United States and Canada because they created a product. But that's what we're doing. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no we, are, we are. We've created three shows which are product, which are intellectual you have shown, property rights. Here's, here's like. why I'm driving down this path. Okay. If you had said, I'm going, here's, I'm going to be the next Cirque du Soleil, there's a gap in the market, there's room for two, I got a show, it's ready to go, and I'm going to spend the money on sending that no, show on the I road. Don't... You aspire to be the next Cirque du Soleil, you put them out yeah. there as the representative model, and yet you show, tell me nothing that shows me how you're going to get from here to there. Doug Richard thinks Paul's plan to make money from a variety of shows is not the route to a profitable company. Peter Jones has different questions. Can you just break me down with regards to the current balance sheet of the company? Yeah. Can I call my advocate to join us? Who is this advocate and what role do they play? He's not an executive director, he's a business advisor to us. Okay, well let's, let's bring him up. This is David Elliott. David and Peter, welcome. Um, what's going to be the business over the next six months? I mean, the business breaks even at about 600,000 turnover. It's heading for 800,000 plus this year. Okay, so the business is going to be profitable this year regardless, and that's a yeah, fact. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, um, the type of revenue you've been creating. It's newly earned money. You've got to create a new concept each time and re-earn the money. Where is the, where is the replicability? Where is the scalability in this business? Uh, I think there's, there's, several, it, there's several relationships with different event companies that might well come back and book That's us. the same customer there's, and a new product. Yeah, and um, within that we also have several major sort of commercial or corporate shows that we sell into different events. Despite his efforts, Paul is still struggling to convince Doug Richard he can make his dream a reality. Rachel Elnor has made up her mind. I don't know much about the whole sort of circus performing business, but I'm sure it works a, a bit like theatre production in that you can have a whole string of failures well, and one hit and then another string of failures. And it's just not an investment for me, so I'm going to declare myself can I just say? Let me tell you what I am, Paul. Oh, well, okay. No. I just but, wanted to well, point out... Well, you've just said an awful lot. You've done an awful lot of time. You've said an awful lot, Paul. Okay. Let me just tell you where I am, OK? <laughs> sitting here, listening to all this going around, has been a bit like sitting in the circus to me. <laughs> Except it's the most ludicrous circus performance I've ever seen. I have no intentions of investing in you, so I'm out. So don't come back at me, please. <laughs> Paul and David's £160,000 venture has completely failed to win over both Duncan Bannatyne and Rachel Elnor. A third dragon has also heard enough. I'm a huge admirer of Cirque du Soleil shows. I've seen them for years. And I actually believe there is room in the market for others. But boy, I don't see it here. But when Cirque started, it wasn't such a, a program business model, was it? No, it, do you know what it was? It, it was a loss-making entity underwritten by the French-Canadian okay. government, Absolutely. and it lost a huge bloody amount of money. I'm glad you made that point. Well, I have to, because you're about to use my money in the same way no, if we I'm go not. down that same no, I'm path. No, Because the difference with us is that we're actually doing commercial entertainment that's actually created a business that's actually Thus is turning over and making money, which is not what Cirque du Soleil did. Thus my so conclusion is, 
is that you, you're not going to be able to leverage it. Search to Soleil, Search to Soleil cost a lot of okay. lost capital before it made money. The, I'm, you know, so I just so you understand. Sure I am but. out. Three Dragons had nothing good to say about Paul and David's circus adventure, and their efforts to raise £160,000 have so far fallen on deaf ears. Theo Pafitis and Peter Jones remain. I like it. Oh, <laughs> good. Um, we've focused a lot on the shows that you put on, but I actually see quite a big opportunity in corporate event arranging. And I actually believe that this is very innovative, this is very new, and this could change the way that corporate hospitality is seen in this country today. But this is quite serious risk. And, and I've got to up the stakes because I need to get more back from it. I'm going to offer you £80,000, but I'm going to want 20%. And on the back of that, I'd sit there with you as a non-exec chairman to help you and to really look at the commercial side of this company to make it tick and make it run effectively, because I think that's what you need. Yeah. Remarkably, Peter Jones is excited by the possibilities of Paul and David's circus and has offered them £80,000. But they still need to raise another 80000 Their hopes rest on the decision of the last remaining dragon, Theo Pafitis. If Peter's going to go on the board as chairman and he's saying that he will play an active part in this business, then I will risk £80,000 of my family's money, but in return I would also like to have 20% or otherwise I'm not interested. Theo Pafitis and Peter Jones have shocked the other dragons by offering Paul and David all the money they came for. But they want 40% of the company, twice the amount Paul and David were hoping to give away. Would you both consider 15% for that uh, investment? Uh, to be honest, uh, I wouldn't, and I think and it's purely because I think you need some quite serious direction and expertise on that team. Um, that comes at a, at a rate, because this, as you know, is a tough business to make money in. But if we get it right, I think we've got an exciting opportunity. But you haven't got that exciting opportunity without me. Hmm. So that's why I'm saying 20%. That's where we're, I'm at. It's decision time for Paul and David. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but will they be prepared to give up 40% of their company? You, you, you won't consider it any other way. It's the 20% for the 80,000 each. Yeah. Right. OK. Well, we'd like to do the deal. Thank you very much. Well done. Welcome, the investment. Thank you. <laughs> Paul and David have got the money for their circus. Despite the risk, both Theo Pafitis and Peter Jones stunned the other dragons by staking £160,000 on the company. Well done, guys. Congratulations. First, congratulations, but I think you truly have underestimated the amount of time you are going to be sucked into it. It's high risk, but I, I can still see corporate events. We both said yeah, it. Yeah, we both said it. We exactly the same thing. We both know a huge opportunity, which, to be fair, they majored on the show. And I think the show is... is Wrong. Is Best of British luck. Well, Paul and David, I bet you didn't think you were going to get that halfway through the whole affair. No, I was feeling that we were uh, going to... I thought we, for a while we were going out there as the cabaret act, but uh, it came good. And, um, uh, and, of course, you forget all the figures, you forget everything. You... <laughs> so, but you, it worked out. You did so. all right, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, and they drove a pretty hard bargain, but it didn't take you very long to make up your mind. I thought that could have... Negotiation could have gone on a bit longer. I think Dave wants to negotiate that wanted to negotiate more than me, I just thought, let's do the deal. Well, we really look forward to see how that gets on, and you can uh, maybe go and have a stiff drink. I think so, yes. <laughs> All okay. right. Thank well, you very Very, very well, well done. Right. Well, no, done. Thank you. Thanks.
Those who met with less success included Caroline Wagstaff, who was pitching her lotion applicator, Back Beauty. What is the part of your body that most people cannot reach? And of course, it's your back. She may have had an inventive idea, but Caroline couldn't persuade the dragons. She was an entrepreneur. I'd like to go and tell Boots and everybody about it. Right. But while I'm thinking about how can I pay my mortgage, I, I get a little bit distracted. The dragons didn't buy it. You don't need investment from us. You just need to take your product and get two or three big orders. You need to find the time to get on the phone and knock on doors. It's down to you. Next up was William Prophet, who came with his multifunctional sports jewellery for tightening screws and football studs. I plan to do these products in platinum as well, so we can tap into the Beckham effect. You do think David Beckham would wear one of these? Obviously, he might not want to wear it because millions of people are going to eventually wear it, but he, we need someone like him to create the catalyst. While Duncan Bannatyne was dubious about the Beckham effect, Theo Pafitis had concerns about William's screwdriver necklace. If you took a nasty fall without hanging around your neck, it would do a serious amount of damage. Well, a lot of people wear crucifixes. This is not a crucifix. William was sent home with some words of wisdom. If you want to go and stand in the street corners and give it away, you'll be better successful like that. But there's nothing else to do with it. And so for that reason, I'm out. Sport was order of the day when Patrick Kelly pitched his free magazine, London Sport. But he couldn't even get off the starting blocks. The magazine is is addressing the need for a, a list, a guide for a guide. Uh, 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 let's, let's start again. And there was worse to come. Did you rehearse your presentation and your pitch? Um, and what circulation are you trying to build up to? Um, do you have any figures? You must have some figures. Doug Richard was having none of it. You're wasting my time. I'm out. Next up is Joe Solera from Swindon. His business proposal came out of a university project. But can he turn an idea into a profitable business? Remember, he has to get at least the £75,000 he's come for, or he goes away with nothing. If I could, before I start, just explain that because of this beam, I can't extend it to what would be a typical ceiling height in a home, so I've had to not put it up so high, so, yep. okay. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Joe. I'm looking for £75,000 of investment. Um, the problem is changing a light bulb, because when you change a light bulb, you have to stand on something. Now, for anybody, that could potentially be dangerous, but if you're elderly or disabled, it holds a lot more dangers. Now, this is the cause of the problem. It's a domestic ceiling rose. This is my ceiling rose. It's similar, although unique, in that it allows anybody to change a light bulb without the risk of accident or injury. This is how it works. All you would do is, and obviously it would be a lot higher than this, you'd pull the light bulb down to you. You then change the bulb. You're on ground level. The power's been disconnected from the ceiling rose. There's no danger of electric shock. You let go, and the bulb's changed. Simple. We're all getting older and we're living longer. And these type of products are going to come out of the speciality shops into the mainstream. Thank you for your time. Joe is looking for £75,000 for his unique pull-down light fitting. In return, he's offering 49% of his company. Joe, 
I'm Peter. Hi, Peter. Where do you come from? What, what, what got you to here? What got you to come up with this I've, amazing idea? I thought of this idea when I was doing a project at university where you had to design a product to help elderly people remain independent within their own home. How old are you now? 39. Christ, what, when did you leave the university? 96, I think, and I worked for an American, American company designing orthopaedic implants and surgical instruments. And that's what you've been doing for the last five or ten years? Yeah. Five, five, six years, yeah. Joe, let's get into some, okay. some specifics then very quickly. Yeah. What is the addressable market? How many people potentially will buy this product? Well, people in the past have mistakenly thought of these type of products as special products, but they're huge market opportunities. The over 50s control 100... <laughs>in this country of the spending market. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me pull you up there. You can't say everybody that hits 50 is your customer. Because my old mum, she hear you say that, she'll be down here with a rolling pin. Because well, she prides herself on being able to change her own light bulb. That's so there is a market, but it is a specialist market. Don't assume that everybody over 50 is going to require a wheelchair, a bath chair, and one of your ceiling roses. New houses have to conform these days. The light switches have got to be a certain height. That's regulation. The doorways have got to be a certain width. And I might perhaps target the housing associations, the builders building new homes to have them installed. The, the, the reason why James Dyson has been successful is because he's managed to persuade people to buy his product. Whether his product's any better than... But his exists. product is for the whole market that uh, buys vacuum cleaners. I'm saying Your product's the, not. I'm saying with the, with the right marketing, perhaps, and the right... OK, how are you going to market it, then? Well, I'm, I'm stood here today because I'm looking for someone to invest in me and my idea that can tell me that. You know, I need to be stood on the shoulders of giants. Unfortunately for Joe, his extraordinary attempt to win over the dragons has bemused rather than impressed them, and his vague grasp of the market has put off Doug Richard. Joe, I have no idea why I would invest, because I don't know whether there's a sufficient number of people to buy it. You might be a good product designer, but you're not an entrepreneur, and that, that's, that, that's fatal for me. So I won't be investing today. With no clear evidence there's actually a market for his idea, Joe has lost the interest of Doug Richard. Duncan Bannatyne wants to know more about the product. What would this cost to buy in a shop? It may cost to have it produced in China, £1.50, £2, and it retail for £8, but I'd like to be less than that. Okay, what does this sell for in the shops? That can cost anything from a pound to two pounds. And that's going to be eight pounds? At, at the complexity of mine compared to that, it could be, it is going to be more expensive, but it gives you more benefits. Yeah. It is going to be more expensive, it's obvious. I tell you what, why, why do they keep packaging these things? Like this? Old people can't get them open, you know. No, I, I made those packets. I just... I can never get them open. Uh, yeah, but I wanted you to visualise this product as though it would be if it was invested in and it was in a shop, as though you picked it off a shelf. It, this isn't on sale then, because no. it says here, Focus DIY. That's just the model. This doesn't exist. This is just a demonstration model. Oh, so it's not... Part of the investment I'm looking for is to actually take this into research and development to produce oh. a pre-production working prototype. You have not as yet built a pre-production model or anything. This is, at the moment, these are mock-ups, yeah. which you've mocked up. You haven't actually built a prototype to see if it actually works. And what you're saying is, eventually, you could have this product on the market selling eight quid. Joe has come to the Dragon's Den with no idea if his product even works. He has big ambitions for his £75,000 project, but with no prototype and no market research, he appears to have made little progress on it since university. Joe, you're so early on the day. 
I can't make a decision on the product because I don't know if it works. It certainly can't hit the market I think you are targeting. It's a very specialist product, but it's not something for me, so I shan't be investing. The Opafetus is out, and Joe's confidence is shrinking. Now he must hope that Duncan Bannatyne, Peter Jones, or Rachel Elnor will invest the £75,000 he needs. Before you go and spend any more money on design consultancies or, or anything, go and actually find, is there a real market? Is there anyone who's going to buy this? Because I suspect if there is one, it's very, very narrow. And it's not something I would invest in. Rachel Elnor is the third dragon out, and Joe's hopes for investment are slipping away. Duncan Bannatyne and Peter Jones are the only dragons left. Joe. I don't think there's any chance of this selling in big quantities in places like B&Q. I don't think it's going to be a big seller ever. Okay. Um, so I'm definitely not going to be investing in you. Okay. Joe, um, I actually think it's quite a good little idea. Um, this isn't a business, though. Um, I don't think you're going to sell any. That's my problem. And for those reasons, that's why I can't invest either. Thank you. Joe's dreams of success have been shattered by the dragons. His conviction alone was not enough to convince them to invest. A tad shell shocked, but it wasn't that bad, was it? No, it was okay. I, uh, I came here with a simple plan, and I knew it was a big risk, a high risk investment. It's a concept that needs developing. It doesn't exist as a product. But you're not going to give up, though. No, no. The, I, I, I'm realistic about my product. They, they might be well off enough to have people do things for them when they get elderly, but one day these people will realise that they won't be able to walk up the stairs in their house when they're 70 years old. That they'll have problems changing a light bulb. But at the moment, this is the whole problem, people don't understand that. And it's hard to sell this vision to younger people. Others who tried and failed in the den included Mark Stollery, who was hoping to charm the dragons with his indoor water lamp. What this does is it brings in the light and the movement of the light into your home, onto your patio, into your conservatory. But Rachel Elnor thought it had limited appeal. You, Mark, you say you've got a huge market opening up for you, but it's not that huge, is it, really? I mean, some people might think this is a carbuncle. And Duncan Bannatyne was one of them. I, I personally, I, I think that's ugly. But that's my opinion. And it wasn't one for Peter Jones. He sleep here. Where am I? <laughs> Peter Morrison and Sharon Hines had high hopes for their electronic targets for testing and training footballers. It enables a player to practice their accuracy of pass, their control, their turning ability, and a few other things. Rachel Elnor wanted to get to grips with their sales figures. How many have you sold from the sports catalogue? Uh, we haven't sold any as yet. But they had demonstrated it to 25 potential customers. And many of these 25 people have purchased? None at the moment. How many have placed an order? None at the moment. You're really stuffed, aren't you? Theo Pafitis put things simply. If you carry on waiting for this to be a success, you'll starve. Frank Hannigan was pitching his sticky label system, which aims to reunite owners with their lost possessions. The way it works is very simple. You buy your labels, you put them on your mobile phones or your laptops, and if you lose it, we get it back for you. But there was just one problem. If I find one of them yes. and I phone that number, yep. the first thing I'm going to say is, what is the reward? There's a default reward, which is £14 worth of our labels. £14 worth of labels? Yeah. I'm going to say, enough of them, so I'm the phone down. Reward for return. Are you not mis-selling it? 
I think it should be no reward for return. Doug Richard had the final word. You have a fundamentally flawed understanding of the business model. I'm out. Next to face the Dragons is 25-year-old Thomas O'Connell from County Monaghan in Ireland. Now, he set up his business straight out of university, but he wants the Dragons to help him build on what he's achieved. He's looking for £200,000. My name is Thomas O'Connor and I'm looking for £200,000. Um, I'm going to tell you about a very exciting entrepreneur. Sports, which is my company. Um, I'm going to tell you about the core product of the company, which is um, the KMX cart. Um, um, the company, uh, a year and a half ago, um, I had a, I was out with a friend. Of, <sighs> Thomas is already having difficulty explaining his idea to the Dragons. A year and a half ago, I was in a, fr in a, in a parent's house who bought um, a KMX from me, and um, the parent said to me, you know, the kid, the kid doesn't stop playing on this product. And um, I had just a kind of a eureka moment where I said to myself, the only way to get kids outdoors and active again is actually to promote new, innovative, active toys. So the idea of the company is to create a brand for new, innovative, active toys. So when per people are thinking, what is the, the new cool toy in the market this year? They're going to think, what's the atomic toy? This is our core product, the KMX cart. And the idea of the KMX is actually um, carts motocross. So if you, if you think of BMX, BMX stands for bikes motocross. Go-karts have been around for a long time. So the idea of the KMX is carts motocross. I'm just going to show you a quick video. Uh, um, it, it has all the relevant safety standards and BS approved. This year, we're looking to kind of break into the UK. And, but basically, that's what I'm looking for the money for. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thomas wants £200,000 for his toy company and plans to use it to launch an off-road cart in the UK. But after his unimpressive pitch, can he win the Dragon's confidence? What's your nearest competition to that? What are you competing with if, if it's on the market? Uh, go karts and bicycles. That's it. And they're, you know, they've been out for a long time. And there's, you know, I've seen something very similar to that. There, there is another product. I, I, I asked you. Yeah. yeah go on. Then. Okay. There's a product called a triker, right? It's got a wheel on the front, one wheel on the front, two wheels in the back, and all you do is you lean to steer. They sold a hundred of them in Ireland last year, right. and I sold two thousand of these. I mean, what's happening now in Ireland is incredible. One guy last year, I, I supplied him with posters, and the kids were coming in. They were robbing the posters out of the shop and taking them home and putting them up in their room. How safe is that? It has all the, it has all the relevant safety standards. Um, it's more safer than a bicycle. If you, it's lower to the ground. If you fall off a bike, you've got a long way to go. Has it got a seatbelt on it? No. Have you got product liability insurance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as the manufacturer. How much did that cost you? It cost two. In reaction in the UK, the business could prove better. But the Dragons need more convincing. Where do you, who makes it? It's, it's made by a company called KMX Cars Limited. I'm the distri distributor for them. Right, so basically, you're a master dealer? Importer. Importer and distributor. Importer and distributor. Yeah. That's your role in it? Yeah, yeah. What proportion of your turnover comes out of KMX, or is that the only thing you do? Well, at the moment, I can't afford to do anything else. I can't afford to buy the, the stock. Um, there are other products out there that I've looked at and do believe in as well. Just tell me what happens when it goes out of fashion. Got to find new products. Quick? 
otherwise liquidation? We do, or they do. You do. No, but uh, like, I don't, like, this is the risk, I suppose. I don't think it's going to go out. Like, but beer, gonna... beer, mix, beer mixes sold like mad when they yeah. first came out. Yeah. Then they completely went... It'll ha what'll happen is it'll have a peak, and then it'll um, level out, and every year there'll be sustained sales, but it'll be nothing like it was for the, maybe the first three, four years. Tom. Hi. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Your next, your sort of long-term value is going to depend on other products that either don't exist or do exist, but we don't yet really know what, what they value they have. Yeah. And so what's the next product going to be? The adult version of the game. After right? that? Um, I've got, well, there's a fantastic product at the moment that I'm looking at. Um, for getting Ireland. It's, a, it's an extreme pogo stick that jumps five feet in the air, and it's absolutely crazy. The kids love it. With products like the pogo stick on the horizon, Thomas seems confident that he can find the next big thing. But if he fails to do so, the success of his company could be short-lived. Tom, I think you actually have the potential to have a really interesting distributorship. I think you've got a nice clear vision for it. You Empty room, fill it up, talk is cheap, listen up. I don't know where we went wrong, but I feel I'm shaking these walls, yeah. Nothing safe, gotta take cover. Still the love, we just make clutter. Running and running, yeah, we got off track. Now we under attack. Could build a niche brand, but the risk for me is that you're not going to get another product. It won't be a long-term success, and so for that reason, I'm out. Okay. Sorry, it isn't one for me either, so I'm out as well. To invest in Thomas's business at this early stage is risky, and Rachel Elnor and Doug Richard are out. Luckily for Thomas, another dragon sees things differently. Can I just say, I think you've really hit on something that's fantastic. You know, uh, I'm a father of six, and getting kids outside away from the computers and televisions yeah. is something that drives me insane. Right. I think it could be a, a, a goer, yeah. but I've got one very serious question for you, for yeah. right? Do you have the sole rights to import those? In the UK and Ireland, yeah. In the UK and Ireland, yeah. you've got sole rights. Yeah. You can guarantee that, you can show me a letter, give me your sole rights. No one else can import those in, no. in Ireland or UK? No, no. Right, you're asking £200,000 for 15% of the company. How negotiable is the 15%? It's not that negotiable. I'm almost going to say I'm not interested. I'm very close to it, and it's only the only your biggest problem is is the percentage. Yeah, but um, let me let me explain. Right, it's got okay, 2,000 units sold in Ireland. Right, the size of the UK market is 10 times the size of Ireland at least. If I sell 10 times, you know, just in one year, or, you know, if I only sell 20,000 units, it's going to make. Tom, close stop. to two million euros. Stop trying to justify it. You've got a bloke who's nearly about to invest. You've got a bloke here that's interested. If you can uh, capture our imagination with your percentages, you might get people here who will invest. But this isn't a startup company. I can't, like, that's not, it's not really fair to go, uh, uh, you know, I've made a profit already. On a, on a lifespan of a product that might be dead tomorrow, so we're relying purely on you finding a replacement product. That product could be dead and buried, our money gone down the spout, and we are relying totally on you finding a new product. Mm. That, my old son, is a startup. Thomas's unwillingness to negotiate has angered Theo Pafitis and Duncan Bannatyne, who both want to do a deal. While Thomas is insisting that his business isn't high risk, Theo Pafitis wants to prove him wrong. Listen, you've got one product and we've got you. Do you know what your debtors and creditors are? Yeah, my debtors are around 70,000 euro. Um, so you've got 70,000 debtors, euros, and creditors? Um, it's, it's about 160, 170,000, 160,000. But that's covered by stock. It's the stock. That's what that's for. Right. Do you owe the VAT man any money? Probably. Talk to me about it. I haven't, I haven't done... I probably do, yeah. If I've, I've lodged two or three hundred thousand over the, since January, I probably owe him money. But as well as that, it's probably balanced now because I'm bringing... You know, I, I, 
it's probably balancing out. I don't know. I, I don't know. So how much do you reckon you might owe them? Um, maybe fifth, maybe forty thousand euro. I, it can't be. I actually I can't. I don't. The va the um, it's what? It? Yeah, maybe forty thousand euro. Yeah. Maybe forty thousand euro. I'm not, I, the reason I'm not doing that is because of cash flow. You know, I need to when I when I get make it. <laughs>
Meanwhile, Duncan Bannatyne and Doug Richard have yet to invest any money at all. So for Peter and Theo, it's show business. For Doug and Duncan, it's no business. Goodbye. Next time on Dragon's Den. This is just ridiculous. I just think what you're talking about is a lot of rubbish. Could you just tell me why you would want me to invest in a company that doesn't intend to make money? To find out how some of the entrepreneurs who pitched in the first series of Dragon's Den have fared over the past year, tune in on Wednesday evening next week at 7 o'clock on BBC Two. And there's a step-by-step -step guide to setting up your own business with useful sources of advice and funding in this BBC book to accompany Dragon's Den.